What's going on everyone? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, bringing you another episode of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. Today we are so lucky to be joined by Elizabeth Rowe, someone I have admired for a long time. Uh, Elizabeth is a leadership and high performance coach and is the principal flutist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. She is also a social justice advocate and a public speaker. After her landmark equal pay lawsuit in 2018, the Boston Globe honored her as Bostonian of the year, calling her, quote, the fighter. Her ongoing commitment to opening up dialogue about complex subjects led to her TED Talk, The Lonely Onlys, where she shared her personal story of learning to embrace the powers of imagination and vulnerability to create connection and community. Elizabeth's coaching practice supports high achievers in demanding work environments as they work to achieve their biggest vision for their personal and professional lives while remaining true to themselves. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. And, you know, I always viewed you as as sort of a pioneer in the industry. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I still believe you're one of the only female principal players in uh, in the big five orchestras, at least in the wind section. Is that true? Yeah, there's a handful of us, um, at, but we are still, you know, outnumbered for sure. Right. I, I'm joined by the principal harpist in the Boston Symphony, my wonderful colleague, but she and I are it in within my orchestra. In Boston. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I know there's a few others in Philadelphia, there's a few and and whatnot. But you know, fortunately it's something that I believe is is changing. And I'm I'm very thankful in, in our orchestra. Actually all the principal wind players except for me at the moment are um the wind the woodwinds are female. Um, and they're terrific. I, I love them. They're just great colleagues. Um, I'm very fortunate also to be married to a strong female leader. And we'll we'll touch base on her a little bit later. But I know that, um, you know, it's really interesting because there are certain things that, that you have to think about, um, not you have to because you want to, but just because of the, the, dyna- the social dynamics uh, of society um, as, as being a, a strong female leader. Um, so what do you think that in a traditionally male dominated profession, what do you think that some of those challenges are? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think, you know, it's very easy for us to see examples of this when we look at women in, in politics, right? When we look at women candidates for president of the United States, for example, and to notice how narrow the path is for them to both exude strength and leadership and competence and confidence while also not somehow crossing over this kind of invisible line where then suddenly they can be seen as, you know, strident or bossy or, you know, all of that, that language that really is often reserved for, for women and women in leadership. So I think that there's an inherent challenge for women stepping into the role of leader because all of us, women included, are mostly exposed to and mostly, frankly, comfortable with essentially a male style of leadership. That's what we've experienced, most of us, for most of our lives and in most spaces. So I think that, you know, that question of what makes for good leadership, what is good leadership, has primarily been answered by men in those roles for a very long time. So as women move into these roles, then there's the question of do we try to sort of emulate that model of leadership or do we bring maybe a different perspective? And if we bring that different perspective, then what does that look like and how is it received? So to think about leadership as having to do with relationships, to think about it as there being a collaborative element, to think about it as having some warmth along with strength. Is that a different style of leadership is that and how is that perceived? And so I think for me, it's been a very long path to sort of figure that out and to find my own way of being in leadership that feels authentic and true to me. That's neither me trying to kind of parrot the male model, nor is it um, me adhering to kind of the expectations that sometimes exist for women of, you know, the, the ways in which we are sometimes thought of as the warm and loving and caring ones and the ones who make people feel better about themselves, but not the ones with the strong ideas or opinions or, you know, firm stance on things. So it's just a, I think it's a whole process for the whole society really to open our minds about what leadership can look like. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's, it's such a fascinating uh, question and, you know, the things that you have to think about, like, I I don't know, did you watch the Marin Alsop documentary on PBS came out a few weeks ago? (laughs) 
I haven't gotten to it yet. I highly recommend it. Um, but she was, so she has this program where she cultivates young female conductors. Um, and she was teaching a class with them and she was talking about the position of one of their hands and, and it was something like this, like their hands, it was some sort of, and she said, you know, try not to use that because as a female who uses that, it's, it's, it's a sign of softness or kindness or, or weakness or whatever you want to say. And I was sitting there thinking like, wow, the, the fact that they have to even consider stuff like that is amazing to me. And it, it goes back to a conversation that I had uh, last, it was a couple of years ago with, with a colleague of mine when all the race riots were going on. Um, and, you know, he asked me, you know, like how many times a day do you think about being white? You know, zero, zero, one maybe. And you ask a, you know, an African-American how, how many times a day they think about it. And it's 50, 100, 500, you know? And so it's something that I, it just, it's amazing to me that we even have to consider things like that. Um, when, you know, I, I try to view, uh, my female colleagues and my female leaders as just, just entities amongst themselves and not as they're a female leader. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think the thing that's so hard for all of us to wrap our minds around is that um, <laughs> the idea of unconscious bias, right? That's the stuff that's not in yeah. our conscious mind, right? So most thoughtful people don't intentionally go around judging women differently or intentionally judging women differently than men or intentionally actively thinking that they prefer men in leadership or actively thinking that men make for better conductors, for example. Mm -hmm. However, We've all grown up in the same society. We've all grown up with the same models of leadership. We've all grown up in the same with the same kind of messages about what strength looks like, what what competence looks like. And so even women, even people who are really committed to trying to see the world fairly and trying to not bring bias into these kinds of conversations or evaluations or the way that we walk through life, we all do it. We all have it. And I think that's one of the hardest hurdles for people to overcome in their own thinking is that try as we might, we all have implicit bias and we sometimes even have implicit bias that is that prejudices prejudices us against our own group, right? right? And so it's just a it's just a hard concept for people to grasp until they become familiar with it. And once we accept that and acknowledge that, then our minds can open up to noticing I ask myself this question all the time, for example, when we have a woman on the podium and I think, ah, she's not my favorite. There's something about her I don't like. And then I catch myself and I say, huh, I wonder what that something right. about her is. And to just slow down a little bit and say, hmm, like, what's that? What's that about? Or I say something about her physicality. And then I think, wait a minute, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Well, even that's, you know, that's another thing too. It's like, you know, there's such a, and you know, a guy can show up and looking like, trash like you just roll out of bed and then but but as soon as somebody doesn't wear makeup it's like the world ends and that's that's crazy to me you know and and talk I talk about with this this with my wife all the time she's the CEO of a nonprofit and you know she says well if I'm too nice then people walk all over me and they view me as weak and if I'm too firm or too mean then I'm you know forgive my language but I'm a bitch and and just you know there's like because of what you're talking about, this unconscious bias, like it's just kind of like how it, whereas like a guy, if a guy's too nice, oh, he's the sweetest guy in the world, or if he's too strong, he's a great strong leader, you know, and that's, that's just the immediately, immediate places where you, where you put these people. Um, and I, I think that we need to do continued work and try to, try to remove the unconscious bias as much as we can and just view these people as people and not put them in, in any sort of gender role. Um, in, yeah. in the professional world, at least. Yeah, that's, that's really true. And I think what you're also describing, which sometimes doesn't go recognized, is it's the kind of behind the scenes emotional labor that people who aren't in the, in the majority powerful group go through. The question of what do I do with my, like, what do I wear? How do I wear my clothes? Like, is it, am I, going to be perceived as too sexualized if I wear something that is revealing. If I, you know, that sort of a question, how, how do I use my voice? Is that going to sound strident? Is that going to sound weak? You know, and then processing also the the little the comments, the little sometimes microaggressions, sometimes not so micro um, that people experience is what you were talking about earlier, how often you have to confront uh, 
your own place in the power dynamics within our society. And when when you are in a role or in a body um, that is historically been, you know, oppressed, the the amount of work that goes into figuring out how to just do your daily life is mm -hmm. it's a lot. And that's work that doesn't go into figuring out how to be a great artist to figuring out right. how you want to shape that phrase to, you know, so that's a lot of essentially wasted energy really behind the scenes that, that people put into navigating this terrain. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I can certainly empathize with it. I, I, I've, I, I've never been in that position myself, but I, you know, I, I just, it's, it's unbelievable to me that we're still there. Um, and I, and I hope that the continued work that you're doing and other people are doing, hopefully we eventually move past that. Um, cause you know, there are, there are lots of amazing women in the music world at least. And, um, they can be just as good, if not better leaders than, than any of their male counterparts. Um, so can you give a little bit of background? I, I mentioned this in your intro uh, about your uh, equal pay lawsuit and just sort of like how that came to be, what was what it was about, just for those who are unfamiliar with, with what happened. Yeah, there's a great article in the Washington Post that you can read that that talks about this and what it what it described in that article. And I was really fortunate in that that newspaper took the time to dig into this issue on a broader level within our industry. And what they discovered is that there's essentially no formula and no consistency and no set of shared values around how we compensate people at kind of the highest level within our industry. There's a lot of regulation and a lot of consistency at the foundational level of pay because right. we have unions that help us with that. But once we get into individuals having to advocate for themselves, negotiate for themselves, then it's basically the Wild West in our industry. <laughs> and you talk to 20 different people and you get 20 different explanations for why the pay is what it is. And so when that kind of landscape exists, what ends up happening is that there are no safeguards against bias, against all of these things we've been talking about. And again, this bias doesn't have to be conscious, right? It doesn't have to be someone sitting down and saying, I'm going to intentionally pay my male principal players more than I pay the female principal players. It, what it is, is I see value in this person. This person is, I think is an incredibly important member of our organization, or this person's argument is very persuasive about why they deserve to be paid more. Or mm -hmm. this person I find irritating and strident when they come in and ask for a raise, you know, all of these kinds of vague perceptions, or even I see great artistry in this person's playing. I don't see such great artistry in that person's playing. You know, this is all highly, highly subjective. <laughs> <Very>. <laughs> I mean, anybody in our industry can, can just stipulate to that. And so then yeah. when we start to connect pay and pay practices to that, or we connect pay practices to, for example, how someone was compensated in a prior job, what ends up happening is that any bias or other factors that are in place in somebody's history then get perpetuated forward. So what exists in my orchestra here in the BSO exists throughout the industry, which is a totally piecemeal kind of framework that doesn't make any sense and isn't coherent. And then when you start to look at the numbers, you see that what ends up happening because of that is, is that almost without exception, your male players are being compensated more highly than your female players. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very complex subject because, you know, of all of these other factors of this long history of our industry kind of holding itself separate from the rest of the world in certain ways saying, Oh, we're artists. We don't think about things like this. This is, you know, this is what the corporate world thinks about. And the corporate world has these rules about pay and compensation, but you know, we have the unions for that. And then other than that, we don't think about it. And it leaves this huge gap really in, in the way that we look at how we treat, you know, working musicians in this country. And I see it as an absolutely staggering opportunity for orchestras to actually come out and literally, you know, put their money where their mouth is or start engaging in behavior and engaging in actual choices and building systems and building frameworks to move our orchestras into really, I was going to say into the 
what century are we in? 21st. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 21st century, I but it really feels like we would be moving ourselves into the, I don't know, into the late yeah. 90s or something like that if we did this. So, you know, there's an enormous opportunity and we haven't, we really as an industry haven't, haven't gotten there yet. So in my case, you know, I, I did what I could in, in, you know, which was partly made possible by the fact that I live in the state of Massachusetts and Massachusetts, um, you know, some of this has to do with basic concepts of fairness and equity, but sure. a surprising piece of this has to do with, with law and how the law defines equal pay and the enormous loopholes that exist in a lot of federal law around equal pay that still allow for really unfair practices to go forward. And so Massachusetts and a handful of other states um, have addressed that. So we had okay. a state law here that is addressing a lot of these things. So the combination of what was at the time almost a $70,000 pay disparity between me and my closest colleague um, mm -hmm. and a, a law in this state that made it no longer acceptable for that to persist um, is were some of the circumstances that went into my, into my um, you know, working very hard over many, many years privately yeah. behind the scenes to get things right. And then when I was not able to accomplish that through all those other mechanisms over many, many years, then ended up in the news. Right. And, you know, I, I remember when that got all announced and I'm friends with your, the second flutist, Clint. Um, and I remember he posted it on his Facebook and just the outpouring of support you got because everyone thought the same thing. They're like, yep, she's right, <laughs> you know? And so, so I'm glad that all that kind of worked out, um, in your favor as it should have. Um, and you know, I, you brought up an interesting point. Do you think that, that, that should be, there should be a more standardized way of addressing pay in, in those overscale positions? Absolutely. There's no, yeah, there's, there's no, so there's no other way around it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, there's, there are different people who are invested in keeping the status quo the way it is. And those tend to be the people that have benefited from this system, right? So it's going to take some time and it's going to take some education and some awareness and really a shift in, in thinking, I think for a lot of people to, to kind of wrap their minds around the idea that, that we've got to make some structural changes, right? And this can't really be fixed person by person piecemeal this way. It's just, that's, that's, it, it's not, it's not sustainable. And frankly, also, again, back to the idea of values and the idea of how an organization, what an organization wants to take a stand for. I think that, um, that organizations that talk about social justice, organizations that talk about participating in our society in a productive way need to put the effort into figuring out how to solve this problem. And it's not solvable overnight and there's going to be tricky, you know, aspects to it, but it's absolutely solvable. And certainly there's got to be a, a much higher level of transparency and a much higher level of, I think, consistency. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing too. And, you know, I'm fortunate that my colleagues are, most of my colleagues are very honest about sort of like where they are and where they stand. But I think that there's this weird, there's still this weird, like hush hush about, oh, this person's getting paid this, this person's getting paid this. Like when somebody asks me, I, I try to be as honest as possible because I want them to get as much as they deserve, you know? And, and I, and I feel like you were probably in a similar situation. Cause I remember that Mr. Ferrillo came out and, and in support of you. Um, and you know, that's, you know, and so for him to be, be honest that way as well, I think is, is terrific. And I just, you know, it's, I think it goes to a broader societal problem. Like I can't stand uh, classified ads now that don't advertise salary. It makes no sense to me. Like, why is it this mystery? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think there's, there is a, you know, first of all, it's highly taboo in our society to talk about money. It, it's, yeah. it's very uncomfortable. I find it like very uncomfortable and right. I just have had to get comfortable with it. But, <laughs> um, because I think also in these circumstances, you know, there's this, if you are among the highest paid, if the system is working for you, there's a sense of status and a sense of, 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 um, you know, that, that you have somehow earned this in a way that makes you special. And so if suddenly everybody has access to that, then it's no longer quite so special. And so I think that there's a very natural, not, I'm not saying it's admirable, but I think it's understandable tendency to want to keep that to yourself, right? And then on the flip sure. side, if you are being compensated quite low compared to your peers, it it can be 
there can be some sense of shame around that. It could, there could be the question of, does this actually reflect my value? Is it, does this, if I tell people what I'm getting paid, are they going to think that that's because I'm not worth as much on some kind yeah. of actual literal level? And so it, there's, there's this kind of emotional component that I think is not talked about as, as much that makes it hard for people at either end of that spectrum to share freely. And so I think that's a, another kind of hurdle to overcome. And as we normalize sharing salaries and as we normalize talking about it more, I think, first of all, it will correct a lot of those enormous imbalances. Yeah. And also it'll just help us understand that we're, we should all be pulling in the same direction, right? We should all be kind of, as of you described, growing the pie instead of trying to get a bigger piece of the pie for yourself. Right. Yeah. And there's also, I think it's just a, a lot of like odd circumstances happen where like people get other jobs and they use that as a way to like get paid more and, and you know, like that's, that's all great. But at the end of the day, like it, you, everyone is out there trying to do the same thing. And, and I agree that we should be all trying to grow the pie and not trying to like, you know, <laughs> t take a bigger slice for ourselves. So, um, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say also, how do we address the 21 year old wonderkind that comes and just, you know, just slays it at an audition and wins, you know, a principal trumpet job in the in the Chicago Symphony and they're 21 yeah. and they don't have another orchestra that they've just come from that they can then use to leverage in one way or the other. Do we somehow devalue their contribution because they don't have that? Um, is that somehow right? So there's like all of these factors that we kind of use as excuses to justify pay in certain circumstances, but then we waive them in other circumstances. And so it's it's just so highly inconsistent that it, it's time for us to 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 think deeply and 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 start to address it in a more systemic way. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've I've had a number of circumstances where I've gone in because things have happened personnel wise. And, you know, it's just amazing, like the amount of reasonings that I had to come up with and then like the counter reasonings that you hear from the other side. And in reality, it's just like, I just want to get paid more because I'm doing more work. And they're from their side, we don't want to pay you more because we're, you know, because <laughs> we, we want to save money. Like it's, it, that's really the basis of the argument. It has nothing to do with like, I'm playing principal now, or this person just got, it's, it's just like, that's really how it, so it's just, it's bizarre. And it's like you said before, highly subjective, you know, what a, what a bass clarinetist should make in an orchestra. What, is it a solo instrument? Like who really cares if it's a solo instrument? It's like, it's just <laughs> anyways. So, um, you know, I, I started following you on Instagram a couple of years ago and, uh, or about a year, I don't remember when it was probably about a year ago. Um, and you, I, I really appreciate how sort of vulnerable you've been, uh, for a variety of topics. And I think that that shows your strength as a leader, um, especially in this industry, there's a, there's a big, uh, I think it's shifting, but there was certainly a big push for sort of fake it till you make it always, everything's always okay. You, you know, you have like, everyone's invincible when they're a performer, they're fearless. And, you know, I, I, there was one post that you shared and, and it was, you know, sometimes you said, sometimes I don't feel great about my playing. Sometimes I made a mistake and I, you know, I beat myself up over it. And to hear that from someone like you is really valuable for someone like me. Cause that's sort of what I've, my goal has been with this podcast in general is just to kind of break down that sort of barrier of, uh, sort of status and, and, uh, you know, invincibility amongst the performers at the highest level. So can you talk about how you make that compromise between being vulnerable, but also being confident? Um, because there's, you know, at a certain point in time, you need to know that you're capable at what you're doing. Such a great question. And it's a, it's a rich question and there's a lot to it. So, you know, this whole idea that people at a certain level or who have achieved a certain kind of status are invincible, infallible, perfect, is something that it certainly our industry has promoted that, right, for a really long time. That's been this kind of idea that that there you achieve this sort of level of I don't know what, but but and then there's a lot of effort put into kind of maintaining that facade. And it's difficult because, you know, our art form asks us to achieve a level of excellence and a, a level of precision and a level of detail. And really, maybe perfection isn't the right word, but we are striving to yeah. create something that is um, an ideal, right? So we spend a lot of our time trying to create an ideal product. Um, 
and yet we are humans. And so there's, I think, where this distinction sometimes falls apart, right, or, or isn't made well, is that we spend a lot of time crafting this kind of idealized version of something, and yet it is a human being behind that that's creating that. And so what has, I think, been a problem in the past is that we have thought that that highly polished product that's put out there is matched to a highly polished person, right? <laughs> and that there's no struggles or flaws or failures that go with that. And what ends up happening is, first of all, there's always, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Like there is no such thing as a failure proof human being or a mistake proof mm -hmm. musician at any level. Um, and when, when we sort of invest in that facade, it, it makes it quite difficult for people on either side of the equation. So I think for people who are in those positions of those highly visible positions of sort of success or at the top of the field, it can feel very, um, isolating, right? And it can also feel like you have to walk a very narrow path, right? Any tiny little blip or bloop is going to shatter this facade and this image. And that's a very lonely and unhappy place to be. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, when you're aspiring to that, or you're looking up at these role models, and you think they're perfect in this way, and then you see yourself and you think, well, gosh, I'm not perfect, even at all. I can never be that. And so it just it, it creates this, this, this barrier, as you described it between and whereas I see us all on the same sort of human spectrum, right? We're all human beings and we all make mistakes. And so it's beneficial for, for all of us, right? When we break down those barriers mm -hmm. and to, to recognize that we're all, we are, are all human in this way. So I think that is the intention behind me sharing these, these pieces is of myself, these, these flaws and these, these times that I struggle and the mistakes that I make and, and to, to basically say, yes, these things happen. And I can also be, a great principal flutist, right? There, that's just part of it, and um, and also the idea about when and how I share these vulnerabilities is something that I think is important to to name because I think there's a there's a big difference between me from my position saying yes I have made these mistakes or yes I struggle with these things or yes I played this like enormous wrong note in the concert the other night and I'm still thinking about it, mm -hmm. um, you know. I'm doing that from from distance and from a place of leadership. So these are not – so there might be other things that have happened in my life that are current that I'm struggling with that I'm not sharing because they're too, they're too vulnerable. They're too raw or recent or painful. So when I share, I'm usually doing it from a place of wanting to, to give something valuable to the conversation, not needing to get something from – Certainly not from a social media audience, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think this is the distinction that sometimes we miss about vulnerability also, because vulnerability just for the sake of vulnerability is not, that is not the point here. It's it's to in, encourage a more honest conversation about what our lives are actually like as musicians. It is not to get your emotional needs met, right? Yeah, it's not, not, not for sympathy, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I think sometimes when people also will judge themselves and say, I just don't feel like I want to be vulnerable in this way, or I just don't feel like it, it feels safe to me or, or, or good to me. And to that, I say, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about hard things that I've been through or experienced, it's almost always with some distance. And so that's part of what allows me to do it. And I find that to be healthy for me. It has its healthy boundaries for me and also serves the conversation, which is really the whole point behind me doing, doing this. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. And I, and I love, yeah, I agree with every single thing that you said there. And it's, it's just so important for people like you and me to, to share those things. Um, just to, to know that everyone goes through them and, you know, there's no, it's really interesting when I think about like my transition from being a student to being a professional, there's no like barrier that you kind of break through. It's just kind of like this hill that you continuously climb or this, this hill, you don't, and you don't like crest any hill. You just keep going up the hill. So there's no, it's not all of a sudden you kick down the door and you have no, uh, inaccuracies or no inadequacies. It's just, you discover new ones along the way. <laughs> Uh -huh. That's right. And I think one of the things that's surprising to people, too, is that there's sometimes this assumption that the more you, quote unquote, achieve, the more confident you become. And I think that that's not that's sometimes not the case. And sometimes, certainly for me, 
I felt pretty confident about myself getting into the, you know, up until I got into the Boston Symphony and then sitting in this chair in this orchestra. And I had a really challenging tenure process. I had, you know, I was certainly receiving a lot of criticism in a lot of different ways. And that shook my confidence and and has been harder for me to recover from and, and to learn from and integrate into my own sense of self than anything that I experienced up until then. And so also, I think sometimes we assume that a title or a position is going to bestow confidence upon us. And where as confidence really comes from your own belief in your ability to tackle the challenges that you're going to face, right? So that it's not that you will never make mistakes again, or that you will never encounter something that's hard for you again. It's that you over time with experience and picking yourself back up and keeping on going, develop the confidence that you have the tools that you need to accomplish something. So whether that's a really hard technical passage or navigating a difficult professional circumstance or even just figuring out what the heck your musical voice is, right? It's just, these are things that we acquire over time, but they're not really bestowed upon us by by a title. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, from my own personal experience, like having a job, obviously I'm not in the Boston Symphony, but you know, I have a tenured position in an orchestra. I get pretty nervous playing in front of people I haven't played with before because I feel like I have to uphold this standard of I have something that they don't have and you know so it's it's definitely a different it's a different kind of stress but it's still there and it's like I said you know like I said the inadequacies and the inconsistencies just kind of change they, they don't necessarily go away in any sort of way um, so can you talk about your TED talk because this this took place when was this probably two years ago three three years ago something yeah. like that it was 2019, I want to say. That sounds right. right. Yep. But yeah. Um, so can you talk about like how that came to be and, uh, you know, how did you, how were you like invited to do that and what did, what did you learn from going through that? Oh yeah, that was quite an experience. It was, yeah. um, it, it was prompted as a result of my lawsuit and the, the, the invitation was to come and talk about something that felt meaningful about, about that. And, you know, what I wanted to do was really move the conversation to a deeper level. And so I had to think about what that might look like. And because, you know, we have, you know, articles like the Washington Post and we have coverage about the pay equity issue, but what's harder to, to know and to, for that I thought was so important for people to understand is again, what you and I are talking about, some of the behind the scenes aspects of what it's like to be in the public eye, what it's like to be a performer and, um, what it's like to be a woman in those kinds of positions. And so my, my, what I ultimately decided that I wanted to talk about was really the experience of being what people describe as an only, right? So it's the, if you're the only person of color in your management team, or if you're the right. only queer person in your sports team, or, you know, that sort of thing where, what that felt like for me. And so what my experience was in that role. And whereas still to this day, you know, the, the Boston Symphony, there's the Boston Symphony Orchestra, but there's also the Boston Symphony Chamber Players, which is this small group of principal players that go on tour, play chamber music concerts. It's a it's a it's a standing group ensemble that for my entire time in the Boston Symphony, I've been the only woman in. So I've been the only woman on stage through so many rehearsals and tours and concerts and just the scrutiny that I felt being in that position. The um pressure I put on myself, um, some of which was self, uh, created, but a lot of which isn't, um, that whole experience. And then what I, the, the choices that I made to defend myself, to guard myself, to protect myself against that, to feel safe in that and to feel kind of powerful and, and essentially unimpeachable, right? Flawless was to try to be that, try to be flawless and to put up these big old barriers and to try to just exude full on you know, total confidence, competence, professionalism at all times. And what ended up happening to me is that I also had built this idea that because I was an only, nobody really could understand what I was going through. So I had that narrative going and it, um, it was very, very lonely. So the, my TED talk, TEDx talk is called the lonely only. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's, it is very, it is very lonely. And, what happened after my lawsuit is that I started connecting with all sorts of people, women, men, 
all over the place in different industries, different professions who reached out to me. And I started to realize that there's so much more in common that I had with so many of these people than I realized. And I also around the same time had this very, very meaningful conversation with a group of young women, young professional musicians, where we talked very openly and honestly about our experiences. And that it was just an extremely powerful conversation and exchange there where I, I, so it's a, sort of like my mind opened up in these two different directions, kind of at a very same time. One was I have, there are far more ways that we can connect with human beings than, than are obvious. And if we could just use our imagination, we can find that. And with this younger cohort, mostly what I brought to that conversation is what you and I have been talking about, which is vulnerability it was telling the truth. It was sharing my actual story, not the perfect version. And that in that space, vulnerability created this beautiful connection there as well. And so I, I wanted to kind of share that and talk about that as my own journey, right, from that lonely only place to being able to use my imagination, use vulnerability in a healthy way to create community that I hadn't seen existed before. It existed. I just didn't know about it. I couldn't find it. I couldn't tap into it. So that's how that came about. The actual process of delivering a TEDx talk, I got to tell you, it is so hard. It is yeah. so hard. <laughs> Because, you know, it's just it's it's just words. I talk all day long. I love to talk. But delivering something that is that precise, that is, you know, has a time limit that you want to choose every word so carefully and doing it from memory. It was I got so tired of hearing myself repeat those words over and over again. <laughs> sure. And I was so nervous. I was so nervous. Um, and I remember the day before I did a trial run for my husband and I, you know, I went down the wrong I took the wrong fork in the road and I Oops. ended up in circles in my, in my talk. And I just remember just, I, I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then I had, <laughs> I had to pick myself back up like many other times and say, you know how to do this. You can do this. Yeah. <laughs> so it was great. It was a great experience. Yeah. Is, it's available on YouTube. Is that where you can yeah, find it? Yeah. Anybody okay. can find it. Yep. Awesome. Um, and then you also started a coaching mindset business. Uh, is it, was it a few years ago is when you started? That's yeah. Right. And so can you talk about what kinds of services you provide and uh, sort of who the clientele is that you serve in general? Yeah. So this really was born out of many, many, many years of me supporting early professional musicians and noticing that I was having conversations with folks that had a lot less to do with how do I practice this excerpt or how do I figure out my Mozart and had a lot more to do with these kinds of questions you and I have been talking about confidence, communication, what does leadership look like? How do you make life choices? Like how do you balance professional and personal lives when they maybe don't line up very well? And especially in our industry, that's really common. So I, I really began to notice that there was this huge need for that. And there was also a, felt to me as though that was where I was having the greatest impact in a lot of ways. I, I, I love to teach the flute, but there are wonderful flute teachers out there all over the place. And I this was a specific area that I was very interested in. So I began by doing that sort of work with, with early professional musicians. So that was sort of where gotcha. I began. But since then, I have moved into doing coaching work in the broader space. So essentially, I work with leaders and other highly accomplished professionals, and I help them figure out how to thrive in a demanding work environment. So something I certainly have a lot of experience with. Um, and I also help them, you know, make either career or personal transitions. So at the moment, I work with people in all different spaces and industries. And um, it's, it's really exciting work. It's sort of thought partnership. It's having a somebody hold up a mirror, to help you see yourself better. It's somebody to ask you the kinds of questions that we generally don't take the time to ask of ourselves and to help think through solutions. And for me, it's very creative and um, very, very satisfying work. Oh, that's so great. Um, and if people wanted to, uh, people were interested in working with you, where can they get in contact with you? Yeah, I, I invite people to come to my website, which is IamElizabethRowe.com. Um, and you can learn about a little bit about that there. And if you want to follow me on um, Instagram also, I'm also at IamElizabethRowe. And I put up a fair amount of just kind of thought pieces there, just mm -hmm. provocative questions or insights that, that I want to share. Um, I also, if you go to my website, you can also sign up for my 
um, email newsletter there too, which I share some thoughts there as well. So, well, that's terrific. Um, and you know, Elizabeth, I, I just can't thank you enough for coming on and speaking with me today. I've admired you for the long, for a long time. I, I you know, I was a fellow at Tanglewood for a couple of years and friends with a lot of great flutists that went through there. And they always talked about how amazing you were even before I got there. So, um, it's just great to get to talk to you and, and all the tremendous work that you've done and, and, uh, just to watch your career from afar on top of the fact that you're just a terrific person and, and an amazing flutist. So, um, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me and for this really absolutely wonderful conversation and for hosting this whole series and doing what you're doing, which is breaking down these barriers, which need to come down. So thank I'm, you for that. I'm trying. I'm trying my best. That's for sure. So for more information about myself and the Candid Clarinetist podcast, please be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist or drop by our website at candidclarinetistpodcast.com. Once again, my name is Sam Rothstein and thanks for tuning in to the Candid Clarinetist podcast.